Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we start this sermon, I just want to share with you uh, a few more pictures from uh, my trip to the Holy Land. I'm going to show you two pictures of Jacob's well, um, which is um, still there. It's in the basement of a Greek Orthodox church. It's a beautiful Greek Orthodox church. Uh, and you have to walk down to the, um, the crypt or the basement to see this. But this is Jacob's well. And uh, Jacob's well appears um, two other times in Scripture. One, it's where... Um, uh, Isaac's um, mother and father send a servant to bring back his wife, Rebecca. They meet at this well. And then um, when Jacob goes, um, is sent away by his um, mom after he tricks his brother, uh, he meets um, Rachel at the well, whom he later will marry, Leah and Rachel. And then it appears uh, here where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman. So this is the well, and it still has um, water in it. They um, took a cup of water and dropped it from the top, and you have to wait about 10 seconds until you hear it um, hit the bottom. It's incredible. It was really hard to get our group to stay quiet long enough to hear it, but you can go to the next picture. It's just another picture of the, the well. This was our guide, um, Sanaa. So it's a picture of the well, and you can see the um, decorations from the Greek Orthodox Church behind it. We got to drink from the well, which is probably the most amazing thing I've ever done. Um, it's really cool, cold water. It was, I don't like to drink water. I'm one of those who would rather drink anything else but water. But this was the most refreshing water I've ever had in my life. It was so good. So I want you to just picture Jacob's well as we hear about this story um, where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman. We're in the um, third week of Lent, and we come to the fourth sermon in our series, The Valley of Shadows. This Lent, we've been taking the time to consider what the shadows are in our world that cause us not to see clearly the light of Christ in our lives. Already, we found that sometimes it is the misuse of good things that cause shadows in our relationship with God, like abundance that sometimes causes us to forget about our dependence upon the one who gives us those things, the giver of life. And sometimes they're negative things that force away our focus, like ignorance or temptation. This week, to, we come to what I see as one of the most important shadows, because I think it feeds into the others, the shadow of isolation. Whether we are the one being isolated or the ones causing others to feel isolated, it often leads to our own inability to fight off the other shadows in isolations, it is easy for us to fall prey to temptation or to indulge in the abundance around us. In isolation, it is easy to hold tightly to our own ignorance and to refuse to hear any differently. When we are the cause of the isolation, making others to feel like they are alone or unwanted, pushing them to the margins and forgetting about them, then we are partly to blame for the shadows that cause harm to them that claim their lives. So today we're going to talk about how we fight this shadow in order that we might be claimed by the light and share that light with others. To learn about this shadow, the shadow of isolation, we come once again to the Gospel of John. John is a very smart writer, and it's one of the things that I really appreciate about the Gospel of John compared to the other Gospels. The other Gospels have their good qualities. Mark, for instance, is brilliance in his brevity, so much so that every detail he decides to share, you know you must pay attention to because he doesn't share very many. Matthew and Luke give us much more vivid pictures of the teachings and healings and time Jesus spends with his disciples. But John is a Gospel all on its own. His poetry in the beginning of the Gospel of John cannot be beaten by any other scripture, I think, and his ability to weave multiple metaphors in and out, chapter to chapter, is nothing short of amazing. We know that John was the last Gospel written. It was written around 90, and we know that he took the time to think about what he wanted to say in his Gospel, exactly what it was he needed to say to help people to understand who this Messiah was and how he could share it in the best way so that they would know what they needed to know. We talked some last week about the multiple uses of light and dark that he employs in his gospel. Right at the beginning, he says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. He sets this metaphor of dark and light up with just those five verses, and we see it use them throughout the rest of the gospel. Last week, we talked about what it meant that Nicodemus came in the night. I told you that John used that time as a literary device to explore Nicodemus' own ignorance of the light, of the Messiah, of the Word of God. So this week, we come to a story that occurs right smack in the middle of the day at noon. In fact, there's a lot about this story of Jesus' interaction with this woman at the well that stand in stark contrast to the story of his interaction with Nicodemus that happened days before. But before we get to that, I'm going to set the stage a little bit for you. We're going to, as Sana says, get situated about where we are. So can you put the, um, the map up, Barry? Jesus had been in Jerusalem for his interaction with Nicodemus. At the end of the second chapter of John, it tells us that Jesus had been in Jerusalem for the Passover, and it was there that Nicodemus comes to him. But after this interaction, in chapter 3, verse 22, it tells us that Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside, where he spent some time there baptizing. So, I'm going to just come over here and point. You see, Jerusalem is right there. I need like two more inches right there. And then this would be Judea. He comes a little bit, um, all of this is Judea, but he comes south of Jerusalem, which is where he's baptizing. So then scripture tells us uh, that after he'd spent time baptizing, Jesus heard that the Pharisees had been told Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. So it tells us that he left Judea and started back to Galilee. Now, there are two choices for the routes where he's going to go. So we're down here in this pale part of Judea. Galilee is the the light orange one above the purple, and the purple is Samaria. Oh, thank you. We need one of those. Okay, so watch the pointer. So Jesus could go from Jerusalem to Galilee. Most people crossed the Jericho, or I'm sorry, crossed the Jordan River and went around Samaria to get up to Galilee. But Really, the quicker way to go was to go straight from Judea through Samaria into Galilee. But most Jews of Jesus' day didn't go that way. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick history lesson so that we understand why that is. So, one might wonder why in these two important areas of Jesus' life, Galilee and Jerusalem, in between there's this huge geographical place in the middle that people avoid. So here's our history lesson. You can think of Samaritans as the, like, long-lost cousins of the Israelites. To to understand the animosity between them, we have to know what happened. About 900 years before Christ, the kingdom of Israel split into two parts, into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which had 10 of the 12 tribes, maintained the name Israel, and the southern kingdom had two tribes, and they took the name of Judah. About 700 years before Christ, the Assyrians moved in and they conquered the northern kingdom, or Israel. And a commonplace practice in that time, when uh, when a government conquered another, was to move part of the population out and to move their own people in so that they could decrease the possibility of a revolt happening in the future. So the Assyrians did just that. And the area where they moved people became known as Samaria, the purple part on the map. It was in the middle of the former kingdom of Israel with the Sea of Galilee to the north. Remember, all the area area around the Sea of Galilee is called Galilee. And Jerusalem to the south. About 150 years later, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, or Judah, marching its leading citizens to Babylon. We call that the Babylonian exile. Then the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And the leader of the Persians, a king named Cyrus, who we hear about in the Old Testament allowed the exiled Jews to return to Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the Jews of the northern kingdom of Israel, who had been allowed to stay in Samaria, the purple part on your map, had intermarried with the folks that the Assyrians had brought in. And more and more outside groups had been brought in in the in-between time. So when the Jews who'd been a part of the Babylonian exile returned to Israel after 50 years, they decided to rebuild their temple that the Babylonians had destroyed. The Samaritans offered to help, but the Judeans rebuffed their offers of help and told them no, they would not allow them to. So this decline to share in the rebuilding of the kingdom of the temple caused the already strained relationship to become even more concretely broken. 
Now, the Samaritans, even though they'd now become a population of mixed nationalities, considered themselves to be the descendants of two of the tribes of Israel, Manasseh and Ephraim, which are the sons of Joseph. And they eventually would hold on to an even more conservative form of religion of the Jewish faith than the people in Jerusalem did. The Samaritans worshipped Yahweh, which is the same God, and they held to a line of Levitical priests just like the Jews did. But they accepted only the Torah, the first five books of our Old Testament, as their holy book. They didn't consider the prophets or the writings like Psalms and Proverbs to be a part of their canon. Even more important than that, they would build their temple on Mount Gerizim, claiming that it was there that Abraham sacrificed Isaiah, not in Jerusalem where the temple mount was. Now, this is probably the most divisive of the issues between the Jews and Samaritans. So over the intervening years, before Jesus comes to visit with this woman at the well, the Jews would go and destroy the Samaritans' temple, and the Samaritans would come to Jerusalem and try to disrupt Passover celebrations in Jerusalem, at least twice that we have recorded in history. It was a contentious fight between family members. Think of it, uh, what's that famous feud they showed on TV with the... Thank you. Think of it like the Hatfields and the McCoys, okay? The Samaritans and the Jews. So, I've lost my place. So, knowing all of that, which I'm sure you will remember the moment you leave here, and all week, gives us a little bit more background as to why it is so amazing that Jesus has this interaction at the well. When you compare these two conversations, the one with Nicodemus and the one with the Samaritan woman at the well, you see that John has paired them up brilliantly. We have Nicodemus, who's a powerful Pharisee, a ruler within the Israelite community in Jerusalem, who comes in the dark to speak with Jesus. And then on the other hand, we have a woman who is never given a name, who belongs to a group of people that the religious leaders in Jerusalem would have nothing to do with. She comes in the day, perhaps because she is shunned by the other women who come to the well earlier in the day. That's what most people have assumed. I think we would be hard-pressed to find a character more on the margins of society than this woman that Jesus meets at the well. The woman is three times a loser. She's just as much an outsider as Nicodemus was an insider. She was about as isolated in the margins of society as she could be. She's a woman in a society where men publicly thanked God that they were not born a woman. She was a Samaritan, which means she was a victim of religious persecution by the Jews. And she was a sinful woman, married and divorced so many times that she doesn't even bother getting married to the latest man in her life. The fact that she was ostracized by the other Samaritan women underscores her status as a nobody. There is one more difference, though, that John emphasizes here in his masterful way, and that is their response to Jesus. Nicodemus comes in the night, plagued by his own ignorance, and has this encounter with Jesus, but then just seems to go away. There is no response, no change of heart, no transformation. But then we have this unnamed woman who comes in the day whose response is to name Christ as the Messiah and to go to the very people that shun her in her own town and encourage them to come and meet this one who knew everything about her. The difference in the two is profound. Once again, we see the way that John weaves in his metaphor. This woman is seen by Jesus in a way that no one else has done yet in John's gospel. And she sees Jesus as the Messiah. She's not blinded by her own ideas of what the Messiah should be, like the leaders in Jerusalem. She is not blinded by her own righteousness or her own tradition. She sees Jesus for what he is. Many a sermon has been written about this encounter at the well. Many a preacher has pontificated about this woman's sinful past. Too many husbands and the inference that she is now living with a man who is not her husband, a sin in the eyes of many. So pastors have written about how Jesus looks past that and he offers her grace anyway. And that is certainly true. But I think John is saying more than that in this passage. I think he's also saying that it's pretty amazing that she sees Jesus in a way that the powerful, the Pharisee who comes in the night, the leadership of the Sanhedrin, the powers that be, the righteous ones, cannot. She doesn't even get a name, but she names the Messiah. Jesus is helping her to step out of the shadow of isolation. 
Because you see, when you are marginalized, when you are told by words and actions and silence that you are an outsider, you know that you have a whole different set of rules to live by. You know where you can go and where you can't. You know who you can talk to and who you can't, what you can hope for and what you can't. And when you are told these things, often enough, you begin to internalize them. You begin to think of yourself as less than, and in some cases, even deserving of the poor treatment of others. And that's where this woman lives in that shadow, isolated place between vulnerability and condescension. But in just the same way that Jesus came to the sinners of Israel, he comes to the sinful woman of Samaria, takes his place in her daily space at the edge of her own community, away from polite society, but never beyond the borders of God's grace. Jesus comes to a place he could have avoided and talks to a woman whom convention says he should stay away from, and he offers her the living water. Not just a quick drink to parch the thirst of her need for relationship, but a deep drink from the well and the overflowing grace of really being known by someone. Jesus holds her in this space where he acknowledges who she is and then declares who he is, the I am. Isn't that what all of us need? This kind of being known for who we are, for what we've done, a place where we can allow ourselves to acknowledge who we are and in that moment be graced by a savior who does not turn away but draws the circle wider, one who floods our lives with this living water that gushes up to eternal life. So what's the opposite of isolation? How do we free ourselves from this shadow? Well, I think if we want to be like Jesus, we include. We include those not like us, those the the world tells us are less than, the not wanted, the ones whom we shouldn't be hanging out with because people might talk, the ones whom society has pushed to the margins, the ones who have to come to the well to get water in the middle of the day so that they won't be seen by others. Most of the time when you talk to a church about inclusion, Their response is, sure, no problem. We're a friendly church and everyone is welcome, right? And that might be true. I know Epworth to be a friendly congregation, a place where people feel welcomed. Visitors have told me that that is true, and I'm proud to be the pastor of a welcoming congregation. But inclusion is not just about welcoming. Think about the setting of our story. It's at the well. It's in Samaria. Jesus didn't stay in Jerusalem at the temple, throw out his arms and say, okay, y'all, all all are welcome to come, Samaritan Jew, women, men, all are welcome, come on in. No, he went to Samaria. He went to the well in the middle of the day, knowing what would happen if he went there. Inclusion is about being intentional. It's about going to the margins to pull them to us. I urge you to think about who your Samaritan woman at the well is. Who is in our community, in your neighborhood, in our world, that is pushed to the edge by our society? Who is it that you, that we, need to go to? Where are the places we can go and show people how to drink from the living water? Let me share with you just three quick examples of what I think it looks like to go to the marginalized. Some of you know that our conference has a relationship with the United Methodist District in Russia, about the size of Texas. Uh, it's called the Black Soil District, and I've been privileged to go there twice to meet um, with the pastors and see the ministry that they're doing. Three of those churches have very unique ministries, especially for where they are. One of them, whose um, pastor is named Galena, works with a prison. Their church is just a few miles, and by church, it's her house and the, like, five people who come on a Sunday, okay? Uh, It's in walking distance from the prison, so when prisoners get released with nothing, they walk right by her house, and Galena invites them into her home and into her church and begins to introduce them to Christ, people who no one wants to be around. She offers them living water and introduces them to the one who already knows them and knows what they've done. There's another church in a city called Veronish that has a ministry for families who have family members with a disability. They've worked to make their building accessible, something that is not required of the buildings in Russia like it is here. In fact, their church building was the only ramp I saw the whole time I was in Russia. 
They do ministry with people that oftentimes can't get around to shop or um, to go to the places where everybody else is. They can't visit with their friends because there's no way to get in and out. So they offer them a place to come and to be, a relationship and the living water. A third church does ministry with children who've been abandoned. Often in Eastern European countries, children with any kind of um, disability, learning, physical, mental, emotional, whatever it is, are left for the state to take care of because the parents don't have the resources, the knowledge, or the support to do it themselves. So this church takes in the kids. The church does it. They offer them a safe space, hugs, warmth, relationships, a family, and a chance to grow in Christ. They come to that place between vulnerability and shame and offer them living water. What would it look like for us here in Cockeysville to go and do the same? It is grace that can and does bring us from the shadows of our own isolation and saves us from isolating others. It is grace that helps us look to the edges, to the margins, to see there our neighbors as well as ourselves. We acknowledge the shadows, but we proclaim the light as the church. We say to those who are at the well in the middle of the day, come and see the one who knows everything about me. Come see the Messiah. Come and be made whole. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.